and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. So it begins, the era of the IMF, with Sri Lanka entering the 17th program with the IMF after our economy crashed, the nation defaulted and after a plethora of pain for our citizens. The leaders of this democratic socialist republic of Sri Lanka say that the only solution, despite there being many, is the IMF. Sri Lanka's relationship with the IMF has been thus far is like a toxic partner you cannot get away from. Instead of focusing on ensuring Sri Lanka's prosperity is coined by its citizens by changing this economy from an importing one to an exporting one, an industrialized economy, Sri Lanka blindly goes back to the loan shark to get another loan. For insights and analysis tonight, I will speak to Professor of Political Economics at Cambridge University UK, Professor Helen Thompson. Director of Research at the Institute of Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School in New York, USA, Dr. Grieve Shelba, former Governor of the Central Bank Ajit Nivad Kabra, Senior Lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Professor Ahilan Kadiragamar, and Member of Parliament of the SJB, Harshana Rajakarma. Good evening, I'm Ahish Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. A very good evening to you. Thank you as always being part of our show. Lots to discuss, so let's get right to it. As we come on the air, Sri Lanka is now a nation under the control of the IMF. You control the economy, you control the country. The growth, the path, the way forward, well, now it's determined, analyzed and executed by people living thousands of miles away. But despite that, the president of our country believes that the IMF is the way. IMF is not the same as the IMF. The IMF is not the same as the IMF. The IMF is not the same as the IMF. The IMF is not the same as the IMF. The IMF is not the same as the IMF. The IMF is not the same as the IMF. Local bank was a winner, Nayada, Labadin, Parshavan, within Tawad dollar, billion, Pataka Pavan, Kadinam, Nayada, Apa Balapur to Enoa. When the IMF bailout package was approved and announced, the Tamasha displayed in Sri Lanka by many, especially in places like Karatnapura and in front of Sirikota, made me think, hang on, did I get it wrong? Is the IMF really good now? Am I professing something wrong to the nation every week? Well, it, didn't, it didn't take long for me to come down to earth and realize that the truth that I have been telling you week after week. What you all celebrated, especially the Colombo liberals, the ones who said they are the IMF is the way, the ones who claim to be think tanks and yet have no ability to think anything else other than what is crafted in the West. What they all celebrated was Sri Lanka getting another loan. This time, perhaps, the worst type of loans you can get because it's not just about getting the loan to, our, to solve our problems, but it's a loan that makes you sell your soul. Weren't these the same buffoons who were talking about Chinese loans and how they destroyed Sri Lanka? Seeing how they changed the narrative to benefit their broken argument is baffling. 
One of the key things the liberal economic pundits in Colombo have been saying while they made the case that Sri Lanka should go to the IMF is that it will create investor confidence. Tell me, honestly, how on earth are you going to create any confidence after defaulting and by taking a loan? Forget about a country. If you know someone who's taking a loan after loan, do you think you would have any confidence in their financial abilities? Who are these liberal clowns trying to fool? It would have made sense about 20 years back because the world was a very different place back then. It surely does not now. If we are to ever create confidence in the rest of the world, let alone investors, all of us have to get back to work and we should transform this nation from an importing dependency to an exporting one and make headway in making new money. Listen, there are things we need to do to put our house in order. By no means I'm saying that our governing structure is perfect. It's the opposite. We have to get rid of corruption. We have to create a system that works for the people. We have to hold our leaders accountable. And we have to find a mechanism to have an industrialized economy to ensure that we earn a lot and not spend a lot. But all that should be done with us Sri Lankans being in the driving seat. The problem is that once the whole IMF program goes uh, sour, mainly because people in the middle income category cannot bear the newly suggested proposals that the IMF wants uh, the government to implement, mainly because they don't understand the cultural context of Sri Lanka, that moment you don't ever think that you can hold the IMF accountable. You and I cannot vote them off power. You and I cannot go to courts and say that the IMF ruined our lives. The sad story is that is where our government has pushed us and is telling us to believe in the atrocious plan that will kill the middle income class and especially the SMEs which are the backbone of our country. The ones who will benefit will be the conglomerates and the big shot companies in Sri Lanka along with those empty headed think tanks. Which makes me to wonder why they were making the biggest ruckus, forcing us to believe in the organization that will only benefit the top 1% and will kill the rest of the 99%. We will be here to expose when it happens and at least in my capacity to hold them accountable. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, you would have heard a broken record if you had witnessed all our shows in the past few weeks. Night after night, we repeat the same thing. What is our message? To alert the public that the IMF will not solve our problems. However, if you look at what's happening right now, you see the rupee appreciating against the dollar, the fuel prices are getting slashed, dollar reserves are going up, and everything seems to be back to normal. Or is it? We need to dive deep into what's happening now. We don't have to look around the world for that. We just have to refer to the six, uh, 16th IMF program that Sri Lanka was in from, I think, July 2016 um, uh, to January of 2019. Being in that IMF program decreased our GDP growth from 5% to 2.3%. So, is it better the 17th time around? Good question. And even more, a better question would be, as a citizen of this country, are you aware of what entails this IMF agreement? Uh, joining me now from the data board is Danidu Vithanamasam. Danidu, good to see you once again. And now I know for a fact that you have been reading the whole 151 pages of the IMF agreement. Um, this time around, which is what I think the president also tabled at parliament. So what did you find out? Good news for us? Well, Mahesh, unfortunately, I can't be bearing good news at the data board and that has been something consecutively that we have dealt with. 
when looking at the IMF report, we see that there have been a number of projections that we need to really look into deeper that will have harmful impacts in the coming days. One of the key expectations is to reach a primary budget balance surplus of 2.3% of GDP from 2025 onwards, from a deficit of 3.8% in 2022, a target that can only be reached by moves such as selling off treasury shares in SOEs. In terms of funding, it is expected that multilateral development banks are to provide 3.7 billion US dollars during the program period which is from 2022 to 2027, of which the World Bank is to provide 1.7 billion US dollars and the Asian Development Bank is to provide 2 billion US dollars. In 2023 alone, the World Bank will provide 250 million US dollars and the Asian Development Bank will provide 650 million US dollars for budget financing. It must be noted that debts to multilateral developmental banks must be paid back even by defaulted nations. Gross official reserves are expected to rise to 4 billion US dollars in 2023 and 11 billion by 2025, which will be financed by foreign exchange purchases from the market directly. The expectation here is that an organic rise in foreign exchange inflows within the country would occur, an assumption with no merit. Well, Mahesh, as you have seen, not a lot of changes from what the IMF generally proposes. We see that at all costs, a primary budget surplus needs to be gained. We see that with high uh, fiscal fiscal changes that are happening, high taxation. SOE prioritization. We are looking at profit-making SOEs mm -hmm. that are being prioritized. The Treasury shares are being sold out. And the central bank independence, the apparent independence of central bank, which no other state has been doing, which states are actually moving away from, and will not allow the central bank to work with the legislature, that is the parliament, in funding, their re in funding the budget. Now, we don't know how this will come about, but very yes. disastrous consequences. I have about. a funny feeling, Danidu, and this is uh, completely in my opinion, that this would, uh, uh, you know, there could be so much of uh, back and forth with, yeah. with the legislature and the central bank and what they can do, and it might end up at the Supreme Court, you know, try to fix and try to figure it out. Um, yeah. We've seen these types of pilot projects implemented by various uh, international organizations in Sri Lanka, and then we are the one who has to suffer. They there's no consequence for the IMF whether this goes right or bust. That is with our as always. Thank you very much at the data board. Well, I want to understand and get a take on the agreement from a neutral party. And for that, I'm now joined by the senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Professor Ahilan Kadragamar, who he joins me via Zoom all the way from Jaffna. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time. Now, what is your take on the IMF uh, agreement with Sri Lanka? How do you interpret the 17th program of the IMF? Mahesh, um, this IMF agreement, the 17th, is probably going to be, be the most significant IMF agreement that Sri Lanka has gone into. Now, we started our first agreement in 1965. Up to now, the most significant ones were in 1977-78, when we went through what is called structural adjustment or in Sri Lanka, what we call the open economy reforms, which set us on what we call a neoliberal path, that is in terms of a free market economy, uh, free trade, free flow of capital, which is also what pushed us to uh, invite foreign capital in, in a major way, but also in the form of debt, which has led to the current debt crisis. Right now, we have gone to the IMF having defaulted on our debt. And this is the first time in our history that we have defaulted on our debt. And the IMF has put two conditions on us that even as early as next year, that we should have a primary budget surplus. That means our revenues should be higher than our expenditure. But this target is almost impossible because just uh, two years ago, our uh, primary budget deficit was on the order of 5.7% deficit. And from there to suddenly reach a um, surplus, it's going to be virtually impossible. Next, they have, are demanding that we restructure our debt with uh, our creditors and almost 53% of our foreign debt is commercial borrowing, a lot of it uh, international sovereign bonds. So these bondholders and there are vulture funds who are going to hold out. Now, these conditions make it virtually impossible, but we have to go through extreme austerity measures with great suffering to the people to be able 
to continue with this IMF agreement. Indeed, uh, understood uh, very clearly. Uh, all right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was the senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Professor Ahilan Kadragamra. Now, a criticism of the current government was uh, that the deal they negotiated with the IMF uh, was weak, mainly because we were negotiating uh, when our economy had gone bust, hence we were not on a stronger footing. However, I am inquisitive to know what a person who had previously negotiated an IMF deal thinks about the current agreement. Uh, joining me now is a former governor of the central bank, Ajit Nimad Kabral, who was in fact the person who negotiated, I think, the uh, six, uh, 15th IMF program in 2009. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, for your time. Appreciate it. Now, what are your thoughts on the current agreement? Will it be beneficial to Sri Lanka? Good evening, Mahesh. Good to be on your show. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, many people ask this question, some think that it's going to do a lot of good for Sri Lanka uh, and I don't want to dash their hopes but if you look at the IMF agreement itself, the agreement that they have uh, stated that there are exceptional risks to this, uh, to this um, program, exceptional risks and that's not a word that they normally use. Now what are these exceptional risks? They're talking about the debt restructuring challenge. They're talking about the exchange rate becoming quite uh, volatile as well as under being under pressure. They talk about the political uncertainty. They talk about the difficulties of revenue mobilization, particularly in a low growth scenario. They're talking about the economic fallout, the weakened banking sector. We must remember that when we are going to have a haircut on the ISPs as well as probably on the local debt and they have given many hints about that in the agreement itself, there is bound to be a lot of pressure being brought upon the banking sector and the NBFI sector. Now these together with the challenges that the EPF will face because EPF has about 29% of the entirety of the government debt uh, as far as the treasury, bills are, treasury bonds are concerned and the EPF has 94% of its investment in government treasuries. So if there is going to be any local debt restructuring, that's going to be a, of enormous significance to all the people in our country and that could be a major political uh, situation as well that we'll have to face. There's going to be market confidence being er eroded and with all these, I think we are going to have a very, very tough time. We're also going to see two distinct dates which are going to be of great significance. First is the 30th of April by which time the government has to come up with its restructuring plan. Now that plan is going to be of uh, serious significance to the entire country and when that comes up I think it's going to have a fair bit of uh, discussion taking place and I don't believe that is going to be very benign as well those discussions. The second is going to be 30th of June by which time the government has to say as to how it's going to roll over or, or roll back the exchange rate uh, restrictions, exchange restrictions that are currently in place as well as the, the other programs that the government has instituted in order to maintain a certain fixed exchange rate position. Now when those laws ro roll back there would definitely be additional pressure on the rupee as well and those are going to be very difficult challenges that the government will face. So I think the government has its work cut out and the central bank work cut out. Restructuring is going to be a very, very difficult program and uh, I have been always saying that um, instead of restructuring we should have been looking at some other type of uh, arrangement with the creditors and now uh, it's there. So I, I believe the government is going to face those challenges fairly and squarely. Indeed. Uh, Governor, what can Sri Lankans expect in the coming few months? Is there anything positive to look forward to? I'm afraid I'll have to say that we'll have to expect a lot of uncertainty, a great deal of uncertainty. As of now, we are feeling that. We know that there is nothing certain. We don't know where the rupee would be. We don't know where the interest rates would be. We don't know what kind of market confidence levels we'd be looking at. We don't know how the debt restructuring is going to be done. We don't know what impact it will have on local institutions. Uh, we are also going to see a large number of asset sales 
as to whether those could take place in the current political environment is another question, whether those could be supported by the current uh, regime is also another question. So we have, we have to face a large number of uncertainties and those uncertainties are not uh, easy to deal with and those are all escalating towards some kind of a, a position where it can be, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I feel bad to say this, but it could be a perfect storm. And if it's a perfect storm, the fallout could be extremely difficult and it would need a great deal of skill as well as a great deal of diplomacy to ride it through. And I would like to see that happening. And I hope there would be a leadership that could deal with it, because if that cannot be done, we're going to have some serious difficulties ahead of us. Indeed, um, very tough times ahead. Let's hope at least we will try to come out this time around because our people cannot be suffering this much, I think from 2019 onwards. All right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, appreciate it. That was the former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nimad Kapra. Now, before we take a break, I want to know what the current opposition, the Samagi Janabalavege, thinks about this IMF deal. Watch. We, the SJB, we think that uh, we, sh we shouldn't have agreed to all these uh, conditions. However, I think the circumstances uh, uh, were not in our favour. So uh, we had to agree to get the IMF. So we believe uh, and we always tell the uh, government to start negotiating as soon as possible, especially when it comes to the uh, income tax and also other uh, uh, conditions. We believe that the uh, government of Sri Lanka should uh, somehow uh, convince the IMF uh, to uh, benefit the Sri Lankans, uh, the population in the country, because the majority of the population, they are finding very difficult to live. The cost of living has gone uh, extremely high and the income tax is unbearable. So uh, we are happy that the IMF uh, uh, is uh, uh, given to us and we, we should work from here. All right, that was a member of parliament from the opposition, Samagi Jana Balavege, Harshana Rajakarana. Let's take a short commercial break. Upon our return, I'll tell you what's happening in Zambia and their efforts with the IMF. You'll be surprised to hear some very familiar stories. Stick around. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, I want to take you to Zambia. Zambia is a landlocked country in the continent of Africa. Their population is around 20 million. Their economy is about $76 billion. Zambia too has economic problems. And they too defaulted and then were forced to go to the IMF back in 2022. Now, in August of last year, Zambia got the nod from the IMF for a $1.3 billion fund facility bailout, of which the first tranche of $185 million was disbursed. Now, for argument's sake, let's say it was the easy part. One of the conditionalities of the IMF agreement with Zambia, uh, well, not even in Zambia, even here in Sri Lanka too, uh, is the Zambian government must immediately start talks with its creditors to write off some parts of the loan. This is where the program is designed to fail, because no creditor who bought bonds to make a buck wants to lose what is due to them. 
Let's get more uh, context uh, to Zambia's story with the IMF and for that joining me now is the Director of Research at the Institute of Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School in New York, USA, Dr. Grieve Chelba. He joins me via, uh, via Zoom from Lusaka, Zambia. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. I appreciate you giving your time uh, to speak to us here. Now, you have been very critical of Zambia's uh, arrangement with the IMF. Why do you have such an opinion on the matter and what is is the actual situation in Zambia that we don't hear about from the mainstream Western media? Uh, Mahesh, thank you so much for having me on your program. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm very critical of the IMF program is precisely because uh, it requires crushing austerity, uh, and that austerity is to be carried by, a poor, by the poor. Essentially, austerity means that expenditures on pro-poor uh, sort of kind of initiatives that are advantages to the poor, social services, health, education, agriculture, subsidies to fuel, uh, both to energy, both fuel and electricity, those are going to be removed. At the same time, the IMF program requires that taxes be raised, but those taxes will largely be imposed on the poor. Uh, and this is the reason, Mahesh, why I'm very critical of the IMF program precisely because the burden of restructuring is going to be carried by the poor, right? On, on the other hand, uh, what, we don't, what you don't get to hear about Zambia on the Western news is that uh, Zambia's debt problems are largely blamed on uh, of China uh, and not so much on Western banks, Western hedge funds, uh, and so on and so forth. But the truth is much more complex. The truth is much more complex, Mahesh, and essentially, there's enough blame to go around, right? It's not one single entity that's to blame for Zambia's debt problem. It's many entities across the globe, uh, many elites in Zambia to blame for Zambia's problem. But I think the Western uh, narrative around Zambia's debt problem is a narrative that blames one entity, right? And it's a narrative that requires that the only way to get ourselves out of this debt problem is to impose crushing austerity on the poor. I mean, listening to you, doctor, it's like deja vu for us here in Sri Lanka because apparently it's the same thing that the IMF is proposing to us as well. It's just cut and paste. This is what we've been telling for a longer period of time. Now, doctor, like in Sri Lanka, many people, politicians and uh, think tanks in Zambia would have pitched that the IMF as the only solution. What should have been Zambia's approach alternative to the IMF? Um, certainly... You know, we have to understand that at the, at the core, we have what what is called a balance of payments crisis or a debt problem, right? So we had a debt problem. So the problem is that we had a lot of debt that was falling due shortly and, uh, and we need to do something about it, right? So traditionally, what has happened is that uh, countries that have a debt problem have gone to the IMF uh, to get some assistance. And essentially, what ha has happened traditionally is that the IMF was the biggest creditor. Traditionally, the IMF or the World Bank were the biggest creditors to many of uh, many countries in the global south. But in the 21st century, that scenario has changed, right? So we have a multitude of creditors, China, private banks, hedge funds, uh, multilateral entities, bilateral entities, and so on and so forth. So given this complexity in terms of sources of credit, it is quite, uh, uh, in, in a way, naive to only engage with one entity, which is the IMF, right? To try to resolve one's debt. So my suggested approach in the Zambian case was that we should have figured out a way on our own of engaging with this multitude of creditors, right? On a case by case basis, because each one of them has got different interests, different motivations and so on and so forth. And it's quite clear in the Zambian case that by going through the IMF route, we have now gotten ourselves in a stalemate, right? I, I think, um, Mahesh, if you've been following the discussions around Zambia's uh, debt situation, is that we're caught up in a stalemate because we went with the IMF route, which then set in motion something that is called the G20 Common Framework, which is supposed to be the framework that's supposed to allow us to resolve our debt. But this framework is very constricting because, again, it presumes that there's only a single creditor with a single motivation. But as we know, we have many, many creditors by age with different complexities. And uh, so this would have been my preferred way of resolving Zambia's debt, to engage our creditors on a case-by-case -case basis.
Absolutely, indeed. Uh, I wish I had more time, but uh, we're running out of time. Uh, thank you. That was the Director of Research at the Institute of Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School in New York, USA, Dr. Grieb Shelba, speaking to us uh, from Lusaka in Zambia. A short break now. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now one of the critical issues Sri Lanka faced uh, that led to a full-blown crisis was its inability to take control of its energy sector. Basically to provide adequate supply for the demand due to the Balancing Act and its production being on the borderline, Sri Lanka faced one of the biggest energy crises it has ever experienced since our independence. When we untangle most of what happened in this area, we also see a lot of geopolitical actors at play. In our case, China, India, and of course, the United States. All of those countries are pushing for their needs and wants. Let's get a better understanding. Joining me now from London, UK, via Zoom, is Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge University, Professor Helen Thompson. Uh, she is also the author of the book, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century, a timely book that all of you must read to understand global economics at this moment. Well, good to see you, Professor. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. First of all, uh, Professor, right now we are at a crucial juncture in the world. Now, the Ukraine war continues. Many things that this might turn out to somewhat of a world war. Many countries in the West are in recession, despite attempts to whitewash it. The Silicon Valley Bank and several other bank failures in the United States seems to give an indication of a possible collapse of the banking system there. How do you read the current situation around the world to be? Thanks for that, Mahesh. I think we have to separate out the question of what's going on with the Ukraine war and its consequences for the world economy with what's gone on over the last few days with the Silicon Valley Bank. And I think in terms of the disruption that comes from the war, the fundamental issue for all countries in the world has essentially arisen from the energy implications of the war. And that has meant that European countries, particularly in the first nine months of 2022, had a particularly hard time adjusting to the absence of Russian um, gas in particular, but it's also, as you well know, hit some countries like Sri Lanka extraordinarily hard because essentially European countries have used high prices to take supply away from some Asian countries. I think on the other side, we have what's happened with the Silicon Valley Bank, which this is an older story, I think, in terms of the underlying structural dynamics around it, parallels going back to the 2008 um, crash. But the thing that's different this time and the point where the two things connect together is in order to deal with energy inflation, which the war didn't cause, but definitely fueled, central banks around the world have wanted to raise interest rates and they've been somewhat led in that anyway by the Federal Reserve. But that has come with, caused enormous problems for financial corporations that have bet on low interest rates, which is essentially what Silicon Valley Bank uh, did. So we're now in a position where essentially that the United States policymakers at the federal level have had to bail this bank out. And that, that means that it's gonna be incredibly difficult for the Fed to carry on with the monetary policy that they uh, have wanted to um, pursue and that will reverberate around the world. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, as you know, Sri Lanka's economy collapsed and is now trying to apply certain measures that uh, have failed Western nations. Now, in your book, you argue the importance of energy independence. Now, in Sri Lanka, the entire crisis began with energy shortages. Now, what are your views on that, especially when a country like Sri Lanka is trying to correct it, uh, its past mistakes? I think that any country that 
has to import significant amounts of energy, fossil fuel energy from abroad, basically has ongoing problems. Sometimes those problems are manageable. They're easier to manage in European countries on the whole than they are in poorer Asian um, countries. But the underlying reality of being dependent upon other parts of the world for essentially the energy that makes any economic activity um, possible is, is pretty difficult. I think if you look at what's happened in Sri Lanka, it goes back to what I was saying in my earlier answer, which is that in terms of the European country's ability to move away from Russia, where gas was concerned in particular, they had to put the problem somewhere else because there simply is not sufficient gas supply in the world for European countries to suddenly start buying much more liquid natural gas without other countries with less ability to meet the prices being shut out of that um, market. So the situation for a country like Sri Lanka is that you kind of need to get away from being in this position of not only fossil fuel foreign dependency, but being in a weak position to compete for supply particularly with European countries. But it's incredibly difficult to do that because we still live in a world in which fossil fuel energy is the most important, fossil fuel energies are the most important source of, of, of um, energy. So you simultaneously have to have a strategy for dealing with the present, i.e. fossil fuel energy dependency, and a strategy for trying to get to a different place, the energy transition, in which there might be some hope uh, of higher level of uh, energy uh, independence. Though, nonetheless, I think the idea that any country outside probably the United States and Russia that can be completely energy independent, and even then I'm not sure it's true of the United, United States, uh, it's pretty hard to imagine. Absolutely makes a lot of sense. Professor, now, do you expect a possible escalation between China and the US to take form much more significantly? And if so, how could that impact the global economy? After all, these are the two giant economies in the world. I think that what we saw during the course of 2022 was clear deterioration in US-China relations over a number of um, issues. The first being essentially the tech war that the Biden, sorry, that the Trump administration uh, had begun and the Biden administration had has continued. And we can see that particularly in the, the semiconductor export ban that Biden put in place against China. Um, in uh, October. And then we've seen the growing tensions over Taiwan. I think in part they would have come anyway, but they were kind of fueled by Russia's war because it looks like uh, Russia's saying Ukraine belongs to us, China says Taiwan belongs to us. The United States takes a different view um, on those um, questions. And obviously the semiconductor issue and the Taiwan issue also go together because 90% of the advanced chips in the world are manufactured in Taiwan. So in any situation in which there was war between China and the United States over Taiwan, we could expect that to have ferocious consequences for the world economy because chips are as important as to how the world economy works these days as, as uh, energy is. So there's considerable incentive, I think, for US and China to try to reduce the tensions between them because there's such the economic stakes is so high, but at the same time is that they have clear strategic interests um, in the Pacific that clash with each other. And so actually finding compromises around those questions, I think is going, is, is going to be incredibly difficult. I'm not of the view that we're on an inevitable path to a US-China war, but I don't think we should also underestimate the dangerousness of the situation. Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Uh, many thanks, indeed. Uh, that was Professor Helen Thompson, Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge University in the UK. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. I will be back with the close.
almost a year ago this network came under heavy criticism by the Colombo liberals why because we went against their views every single thing we said at that time has now become true at that time this liberal mafia led by a fake journalist who couldn't write an article to garner recognition in the usual sense of a journalist but the only way she thought she could muster fame was by creating chaos through mudslinging this same fake journalist gave social media leadership to last year's unrest after being dictated by the American ambassador, coupled with another racist journalist whose life goal is to disseminate hate, turmoil and her love for cake. Along with them, there were fake human rights jokers and other misinformed PhD holders supported by a particular television network who said that they are on the side of the people. But all what they do is show the worst of Sri Lanka. Each and every one of them started a failed campaign called Boycott Derana. Their argument rotated around two things. Derana broadcasted news stories about a snake from the Kalani River and the Dhammikapaniya that was the talk of the town during Covid times. Let's for a moment take those two stories and ask what happened. Did we go and ask the snake, hey, come, 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 come to the show? so we can record it and show it to the people and fool them. That didn't happen. What happened was that the Nai Kathero of the Kalaniya temple said that a person in the temple saw a snake rising from the waters of the Kalaniya river. What did we do? As journalists, we reported it. That's our job. Not to judge, but to report. Because news for us is not an opinion show, unlike this program. State of the Nation, which is an opinion show. If we were so wrong and trying to fool the nation, shouldn't the Kalania Temple be deserted today? Shouldn't people in that area shut it down because it's fooling the people? That hasn't been the case. On the contrary, the Kalania Temple sees thousands and thousands of faithful people coming there to uplift their faith. Even if you go today and speak to the Nayakathera, he will still stand by what he said and show you where this so-called snake went by. Derana reported it, as we are called to do. And it was not only us who reported it, all the other channels and other media outlets equally did as well. It's the same with the Campania. We reported it. We didn't ask you to buy it or tell you it's better than the vaccine. As a responsible news outlet, we presented various views on the matter to you. Again, we reported it as we were called to do. If you closely watch, you can see a targeted attempt by the so-called hoity-toity Colombo liberals. Why? Because they can't stand a local organization bringing in local values, uplifting local talents, showcasing the richness of our country and striving to find solutions of our own rather than allowing them to fool you into failing, falling into their bull. They parrot out as solutions coined by their Western masters. That's why they hate us. If you look at the current economic crisis, other Derana was and is the only place that gives you all sides to the story. We give you views that supports the IMF deal. This program, State of the Nation, provides views that are against it and some shows you views of other alternatives. We don't decide what you should think. We don't tell you what to think, but we give you the tools and information to let you think on your own. Despite all their hateful efforts and worthless campaigns, last week we at Derana received several awards from Brigham Tellies and of course the People's Awards organized by Slim Cantor. While our program were garnered uh, with top honors, I want to bring your attention to a couple of significant awards. At Raikam Tellies, the award for most popular newscast, and at People's Awards, the TV channel of the year for TV Derana, the best news provider of the year for other Derana, and the most popular youth TV channel for TV Derana. Those are awards garnered after a nationwide scientific poll, which showed that we are still the go-to entertainment and news source for most Sri Lankans. Oh yes, nationwide, not just Colombo, as Colombo liberals think that the rest of the nation revolves around them and their failed ideology. Despite the Colombo liberals' hateful brigades failed boycott their campaign, the real patriotic community of this country, which is clearly not with the hateful liberals, 
uplifted their derana and continues to rally around the truth no matter how hard a lie tries to shout down and to masquerade as the gospel truth. Please don't hate us for reporting the story. Hate the very few teaching you to be a snowflake and throwing dust in your eye to refrain you from seeing the truth. Despite all the bull and horse crap you see on and hear on social media about Derana, every scientific indicator says that the people are with Derana. And Derana is with the people. To the boycott Derana Brigade, hate all you want, laugh all you want, and do whatever to make your worthless lives tolerable. I get it. That's all you have. But what we have is the real people of this country who in their own way keeps fighting for a better nation alongside us. We will continue to safeguard our own and bring you to the new. That's a promise. On a programming note, listen to our podcast which is released weekly. Do check us out, the State of the Nation podcast, available on Apple Podcast and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny. From all of us at Other Dera 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll be back again uh, next Tuesday at 7 on Get Real. My guest this week is Professor Lalita Sirik Gunurwan. Make sure you catch that. Have a good night. <laughs>